All right, everybody, welcome, welcome. This is Drawing Together. My name is Scott Meyer. Uh, we are with Artist Network. We meet every Wednesday here to draw together. So uh, I apologize for starting a little bit late here. I had some, some trouble with the cameras, so I had to make some last minute changes, but that's, that's what we do here. Um, so this is what we're working on today. It's a lovely portrait. Um, and as you all know, portraits are hard for me. <laughs> I think they're hard for a lot of people, um, but I feel like I'm getting better at them. And I hope you are as well. So we're gonna do our best today. Um, especially drawing children can be a challenge trying to capture the correct age, right? You know, make them look appropriately aged. Um, so that's what we'll try to focus on today, see if we can capture that. Um, and I think it all comes down to getting those proportions right. So um, we, let's see, I don't wanna delay much longer, but if you are new, you're gonna to wanna to know that you can follow along. So you can find the reference image, the one that's right below me. You'll find that in the description below. You'll find the list of materials as well. So I'll be working today with this toned paper. Um, this is sized to about an eight by 10, so a little bit smaller. Uh, this is the Strathmore gray toned paper. Um, I've got some vine charcoal that I'll be doing some initial layouts with. A um, couple charcoal pencils. I'm gonna work with the 2B and the 6B. So a little bit harder, a little bit softer, uh, so a little bit lighter, a little bit darker, um, and then a white a charcoal to bring out some of the highlights. Um, uh, other materials, I've got my trusty blending stump. We're gonna use that a lot today uh, to really kind of work those transitions. It, one of the things that I noticed about this gray toned paper is it's got some variations in it that can be a little bit tricky to work with if we need to get create a nice smooth transition. So we'll try that today. Um, I have a uh, rubber eraser here that I have shaved down to a nice sharp point. We're gonna use that for some of those details and a uh, kneaded eraser for uh, some other areas. So. Um, bringing this back, this is a preparatory drawing uh, that I, I like to do a drawing in advance to kind of wrap my head around what this whole thing is going to be about, right? And what are the key issues to deal with? Um, and it all really comes down to proportions for me. That's like whenever I, uh, whenever I work on a portrait, I find that the areas that I struggle with all come down to getting those proportions right. Uh, you know, so I may, you know, nail the, 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 the features, for example, maybe I get them exactly how I want them, but if they're not in the right spot, then it's really hard to make a portrait look like the person. So uh, that's what we'll try to focus on today. And then within that, um, focus on some real, some basic techniques working with these materials to create those smooth transitions. So looking at this right here, right now, I feel like there's some issues with it that I, you know, could potentially improve upon. So we'll, we'll try to stay really focused on some of those finer details that can pull this all together. So this might run a little bit long. Um, generally, they run about two hours. Um, if you can't stay for the whole thing, this goes up as a recording and you can watch again later. If you have any questions or comments, observations, anything that you wanna share with the group, um, feel free to, to chat that. Anything in all caps is a little bit easier for me to see. So if you type in all caps a question, I'm more likely to see it. So um, again, welcome everybody. It's awesome to see so many familiar uh, names here. Um, uh, Marie, I see, I think you were in the first episode. It was awesome. Yeah, I see a lot of you, uh, JC Ramble, um, uh, hello Claude. A lot of people um, that I've been seeing for a very long time. Um, I don't have time to shout out to everybody. Ursula, welcome. Um, and I love to see everybody's drawing. So if there's a link that I pinned in the chat uh, that will take you to the show page where you can share your work when you're all done. So, um, all right. So what I have in my setup, and this could be really helpful for you um, if you're following along, I have my, my reference image on the left and on the right here on the screen in front of me, I have the overhead projection so I can kind of see the, the drawing and the image side by side. So if I were to be working in a, in a, a really the, an optimal drawing environment, instead of working on this uh, largely flat, kind of slightly inclined surface, I'd be working vertically on an easel and I could have the, the, the sitter next to the, uh, next to the paper. Or if I, if I don't have a live model, then I would have this, this reference photo and I would just have them side by side. It makes it much easier to transfer um, proportions and, and observe those things. So um, I kind of have a, a, a setup similar to that. Um, and, uh, but 
you know, working from life, I'll be working on this inclined surface. So I'll be working with the projection up in front of me um, to help with that. Um, let's see, Ursula is asking, what is the weight of the paper? Let me see if I can bring this up so you know specifically. It is this gray toned paper. It is 80 pounds, so it's pretty light. Nothing super heavy, but I really like this. Um, it doesn't have a, a, a strong tooth to it, but it's got a, enough of one to, to work with a variety of materials. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a gesture. Uh, all drawing for me, it comes down to the gesture. Uh, and I, I like to, to think about the, you know, the drawing process is the continual refinement of that gesture. And it doesn't mean that you get the gesture accurately right off the bat. Um, but if you have this mindset of that, you know, we're going through the process and continually um, refining that gesture, then all, every mark you make is kind of up for grabs um, with regards to being, you know, uh, being corrected. So. Uh, one of the things that I kind of a, I observe early on in this is this general play uh, of light and shadow where, you know, it's fairly dark in the background, um, but there's light coming in from this side. So we have a, a darker background against light transitioning to shadow, and then I'm going to keep this fairly light back here. So we have this play of dark to light to dark to light. Uh, and that I think will help to um, help to pull everything together and and work with the composition. So um, I'm using this kind of overhand grip because I want this fine charcoal to kind of float on the surface. Uh, so if you're not working in charcoal, if you're working with uh, graphite, for example, then uh, use a, a a light touch, an overhand grip. As like I said, I think works well because it allows the marks to float on the surface of the paper rather than creating embossed lines. Uh, if you're working with graphite, those harder pencils that create the lighter marks uh, can sometimes also scratch the surface of the paper. So I like to use, work with soft materials. Um, and my, um, as you can see, my initial gesture is really based on getting the shape of the head and not focusing too much on the features early on. I want to place the head properly first um, and think about kind of the basic structure um, and then we'll we'll get into we'll get into the features in a bit um, all right the and as you can see I, I kind of I laid down the marks I've wiped them down uh, with the vine charcoal everything's very light I'm just using the the side of my hand because I want to create I, I really I, I want to move through quickly and I want to do a bunch of these gestures. Each time I do a gesture, I'm going to learn a little bit more about this subject. I'm kind of rolling the, the charcoal in my fingers a bit so that I don't develop kind of extreme kind of um, flat spots in it that could be problematic later. Uh, and then if I were to start kind of mapping out the placement of the features, you might start with this kind of the, the central axis uh, to help establish uh, an orientation point for, for symmetry um, and uh, kind of a horizontal axis for the eyes. Now, where I've always struggled in the past is that I'll lay this out and then I'll get stuck to that. So I have to remind myself that these are just kind of initial guesses. They're, they're, um, they, they help to orient myself, but they, I don't want to get locked into them. Because uh, when I do, that's when I, I really kind of get myself into trouble. Um, you know, I, I start to get to the final stages too early. Uh, so it's just something to kind of keep in mind. And I think what I want to do actually is start by you know, observing generally that the, the the light and shadow, it divides the, the head pretty effectively so along that central axis. So I can, it can make an, uh, an early decision between light and shadow here. And then I can start to map out the placement of the features along there. And then you start to see there's a bit of a shadow here uh, on the 
the eye that's on the light side of the head. And so I think, you know, the approach I think I'm going to take today is one where I'm going to try to think broadly about these forms and then gradually get more specific. I know some portrait artists will really map out the features, lock those in, and then build outward from there and, and complete the rest. But I think I want to do it the other, another way uh, and, and really just build it from a, a sense of light and shadow and form and then gradually add the details. Uh, so with, as, I, as I start to establish this initial gesture, uh, features are going to start to form. Um, and then as they start to form, I will have information that I can use to then evaluate uh, proportions. So my eyes are blurred right now as I, look at this, as, a, as I look at the reference, as I look at the drawing, I try to keep my eyes out of focus and see if I can kind of capture the, the spirit of the, the subject quickly. And at this point, I'm also, I'm trying to do my best to not identify with these forms as, as facial features, uh, you know, as a portrait, as eyes, nose, mouth, things like that. I'm trying to um, try to think of abstractly, you know, what these marks are, where, what shapes am I looking at, where are they placed, etc. And then Cubs Win is asking, what's your painting choice? Watercolor, acrylic, oil? I typically paint with uh, oils. I was actually priming some canvases early today to start working on some, um, working on some landscapes. Um, but I just received a, a set of watercolors that I'm excited to play with. And <clears throat> also done some pastel work, which I really like. I think it's helpful to to uh, work with a variety of media. Um, so I try to, I, even though I primarily work with oils, I try to um, try to throw in some other, other uh, media there too to help me better understand the, the subject. All right, so I'm still in that gesture mentality when I'm making my marks. And as you can see, as I, as I start to, um, as I'm reacting to these forms, I'm, I'm letting marks run long. I'm thinking more about kind of axes and things like that. And we'll let, let the, the image kind of emerge on the page. Um, and when you're, when you're blurring your vision, that can happen in a, in a couple ways. I've talked about this before, but, um, you know, squinting is typically the, 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 the way that most people allow their, their vision to blur. You can just close your eyes really narrowly, um, and that helps to prioritize value relationships. It also eliminates details and can also sometimes heighten the contrast. Um, so what I like to do is, is fluctuate. I need to go back and forth between squinting at the object and then opening my eyes wide, letting light really flood in. And, and letting everything kind of lose focus. So I kind of, it's almost like I focus on a spot right in front of me, but put my awareness on the subject that's distant and that, that puts it out of focus. Um, and when you combine observations in both of those kind of processes for squinting, it can give you a, a better understanding of the subject. Um, and so you might see me kind of playing with my, my eyes a little bit, <laughs> squinting and um, such. And that's really what I'm doing is, is I'm trying to, um, trying to create a variety of, of um, ways at which I'm observing the subject. And I'm staying with the, the vine charcoal for a while, a little bit longer. Now, let's see, I think this, this feels like the placement is all right, so I think I can start to make more specific observations here. And, and it's all about getting, it's, it's gradually kind of narrowing the, the range uh, as you're working. So I'm making these initial observations, 
and they're kind of getting me in the ballpark with regards to getting the correct proportions. But I'm going to um, I'm going to gradually narrow that and hopefully get more specific as we go. So I want to switch to the 2B charcoal pencil. So I'm going to use this overhand grip so it allows me to work in a similar fashion, but these marks start to become a little bit more permanent. So just kind of washing over the drawing. And this is just building up a layer of, of uh, compressed charcoal, kind of replacing the vine charcoal a little bit. Gotta remind myself to roll the, the pencil as I go. And I want these edges to be soft at this point because I, I don't really know where uh, the edges of the head are going to be or where those features are going to be. I know generally where they are going are to go, but if I make harder lines at this point, then it starts to lock me in. And I'm not quite ready for that. I need to spend more time with the subject before I can really make those definitive statements. Um, but again, for those of you who have been with me for a while, you know that my, my general philosophy in drawing, my process, is to, to build from the gesture and it's, it's about gradually refi refining and bringing the entire drawing up so that it puts you in control of how much detail you want to add. I'm just going to add a little bit of tone to that background. And I also have to remind myself that because I'm working with toned paper, uh, I have the ability to build the lights out from the, um, from the background. Or, you know, so from that, from that gray ground, I can bring the lights up a little bit. So, um, and I have to remind myself that because I'll, we're gonna start to calibrate our observations to that. We're gonna start to assign this gray as being the lightest light and interpret it as white. So that, that can be a, a challenge there. And then once we add the white, everything is gonna Everything's going to change. Uh, Krisha, please help. My nose is too far. Um, JC, JC, you and I have been with Cap for a year now, huh? Yeah, Cynthia, you're welcome. Um, it's true. Oh, Tammy, darn, driving out and about every time you're alive or at work. Oh, no, I'm sorry to hear it. Um, and maybe we can start to change times up a little bit. But um, I know for some of you that were with me, we, we started at three days a week. That was a lot. <laughs> now we're down to one. Uh, I wish I could do this every day, but um, not quite working for that. So... Um, so now let's see, shifting my, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep my observations on the overall head. I can feel right now a desire to get in there and start drawing the features. Um, and that is, uh, that's throwing red flags in my mind right now. It's saying, wait, stop, <laughs> don't do, don't get into them yet. Um, but hopefully right now that as, even in this blurred state, it, it, in some ways, kind of, it, we recognize it as a as a head and as a portrait. And I can also feel that my observations here, looking at li in life, when I'm looking at it at an angle, it's really different than what I see in the overhead projection. And so I re I need to make sure that I'm I'm relying more on that overhead projection to um, to make my decisions. So I'm, I'm intentionally holding the pencil really far back, using the side of it. You can see that I shaved it down, um, and then by, by using a razor blade to cut this down, it allows me to lay it almost flat on the page. You know, if I if I work with a pencil straight out of the box, you really it forces you to use a, a tripod grip um, and use the tip of the pencil. And so if you're if you're struggling, you may find that might, may find it easier to kind of play with the. Um, Play with the way you sharpen the pencil. I gotta, this, there's a little bubble in the paper that I need to um, 
need to adjust. When I taped it down, I didn't do quite as good a job as I need to. Let's see if that, that worked. All right. Uh, is a B, my gestures seem more important than the feature. Um, I, and it, I have a hard time reading the, um, you know, reading those comments, but I, yeah, I think that what I get from your comment there is that the, you know, how, how important the gesture is and really what a, what a gesture is, is, is that initial response to the form, um, and paying attention to really how an object fills the space, the way it moves through the space. Um, and the kind of the, the quality of its form more than uh, as you're suggesting is the, uh, the, the precision of it all. Um, and so much can be carried through to that. You know, we, we talked about that here, that the idea that marks are thoughts, right? You know, so every mark that we make starts as an impulse in the mind and it travels down our arm into the, into the pencil, onto the surface. Um, and a gesture is, it really kind of works with that mentality. It, it's, it's about a, a free-flowing connection between your observations and what's happening on the page. Um, and so I feel like it, so much can be conveyed through a gesture um, that, you know, it, it, if, if it's not something that you've spent a lot of time doing, um, I would encourage you to do that and, and uh, you know, grab a sketchbook and fill it with just gesture drawings or whatever you're observing. You know, if there's people or still lives or if you're on location and you're sketching, um, you know, focus on that initial reaction and try to try to shorten the gap between the thought process and the reaction on the page. It can be a great way to build up hand-eye coordination. Um, and it can lead to some really innovative mark making. Okay, so what do I want to do here? I want to figure out where, generally the eyes fall in the center of the head. So I want to evaluate this. And what I'm doing is I'm using some comparative measuring techniques. So if you're new to that, what that means is that I'm looking at the subject and I'm comparing the, the scale of one feature to other things in the, in the, in the drawing. So how, how tall is it compared to its width? Um, you know, what is the distance between the eyes, etc. So in order for me to do that, I have the reference in front of me, I'm closing one eye so that it flattens my depth perception, I'm holding this pencil out and it makes it feel like the pencil is directly on top of the image, and I'm taking a, a measurement, I'm aligning the top of the pencil with the space right between her eyes, and I'm sliding this finger down so that it meets the, uh, the bottom of the chin. Now, then I'm gonna take that and without, without moving the pencil in and out, without changing this distance here, I'm gonna just bring it up and I'm gonna place this part at the, at the space right between the eyes. And so in that way I can compare the distance from the bridge of the nose to the chin to the bridge of the nose to the top of the head. And, and just double check that the eyes are in the center. And it looks like from this perspective, that's exactly where it is. So if I were to take this and then cut it in half and compare this distance to this distance, they should be the same. Um, now, as I do that, if I'm happy with this distance here, it only gets me part of the way in terms of getting the overall proportions because uh, then I also have to evaluate the width. Um, so I'm gonna take that same measurement, so the distance from the, this is the bridge of the nose here to the chin bridge of the nose to the top of the head. I want to evaluate that actually kind of in my own way. I'm going to take that distance and I'm going to, going to compare it to the width of the head. And what I observe is that then this distance here, bridge of the nose, the bottom of the chin, is equivalent to the, the distance between the outer corner of her, of her eyes. So if I have my central axis here, I can place one, the corner of one eye there, and the corner of the second eye right here. Um, and 
when I do that, I start to see that this distance here might be a bit too small. So I'm gonna, in the, I'm gonna keep double checking these, these proportions as I go. So I may end up you know, moving this line left or right a little bit as we go, but it, we're starting to create then um, specific observations about those proportions that, that will hopefully help to bring this all together. I was just looking for my kneaded eraser and it's right in my hand. All right. So I'm gonna to start to kind of create the, the shading on our eyeball here that's in the light. And I wanna focus on the, the shape of the shadow in that eye socket on this side. So think about the larger zone uh, within which the eye sits. I'm using my fingers, which is not a great idea. I need to stop doing that. <laughs> so I, uh, it's one of those things I forget about when I'm working. Um, because it's just so darn easy to use my, my fingers to, to blend with. Um, so I can still see those marks there pretty clearly. There's the center of the, um, of the, you know, the, the bridge of the nose there. Now I can start to map out the nose and then the mouth. And so the nose makes when I squint at it, it makes an interesting kind of shadow shape. I'll, I'll kind of roughly replicate what I'm seeing there. Um, and then within that, I'll start to um, become more specific with those features. So I'm going to look at, I'm going to try to ignore the lips right now and just try to indicate the shape around the mouth that is formed there. There's kind of a cylindrical form um, that I want to try to observe. And then, you know, squinting, you can start to see this kind of shape across here, across the bottom. Um, I wish I could be more specific with that, describing what that shape is, but um, it's a bit of a challenge. So I'm observing this shape in here, this kind of triangular like form. And then underneath her lip, there's a shadow that cuts across the chin into that light area. And then I'm gonna indicate the mouth. There's a bit of an axis. So you got this little smirk. Um, This is all very kind of gentle in terms of the, the touch on the page. Uh, but I want to start to map out some of these major kind of forms before I get to the features um, and, and start to think about the transition between the features more than the features themselves. So, and this is one of the things I, I recommend to students who, who have a hard time breaking the habit of drawing the eyes and nose and the mouth first is to try to switch to the um, switch to your observations to the spaces between the features and draw them. Um, so the the effect that that of this whole drawing process is then is almost like a uh, a camera coming into focus. You know, where as as our observations are are developing, the the drawing develops. 
and the image becomes more clear. Uh, keep smoothing this out, build it up, smooth it out, and go from there. So. Oh, Aaron Bell says, that could easily turn into a creepy doll at this stage. Yes. Yeah, that is the hardest part of, of uh, it, not the hardest part of the portrait drawing, but like it's the hardest thing to deal with, I think sometimes, is to look at the portrait and it just creep you out. So, and I have had so many of those. Um, it's part of that, that uncanny valley effect that as we start to uh, approach an accurate likeness, then it creates a sense of, of uncomfortability. <laughs> it makes you feel uncomfortable um, because we're so sensitive to, um, to faces and the subtle variations in um, expression and such. And so it's so easy to make something that feels lifeless. And that's where sometimes it, you can maintain more of an impressionistic approach and um, and instead, you know, like focus really more on a gestural approach, um, so that it doesn't doesn't read initially too realistically. Um, it's but that's the hardest part. I've done so many portraits that you look at them and they just they just creep me out more than anything. Uh, I'm kind of floating around the drawing right now. I, I felt myself getting locked in on the features a bit too early. Um, you know, a bit kind of mentally, it was taking up too much space in my mind. So. Um, I'm kind of moving around to other, other parts here. Uh, but I just hope everybody's being kind to themselves as you're drawing. That's what this show is all about. We're practicing, not perfecting. Um, you know, we're hopefully practice will lead to perfection, but it's about perfect practice more than perfect drawing. Um, but you know, sometimes we, we put so much pressure on ourselves to do a good drawing or good painting. Um, but what often, often leads to those is a whole series of uh, learning opportunities in, in drawing and painting. So remember, uh, in, a, in an interview with Kwang Ho we did for um, the Artbound podcast, he, he talks about how, you know, the reason, he's, the reason he's, he's good is that he's failed more times than most people have tried, right? And uh, so I keep that in my, running in my, my head is that you know, failure is essential. You know, I, I'm using the word failure in a, you know, an imprecise way, but um, hopefully you get the point that you know, so if we just kind of take the pressure off and enjoy the process, practice, and be okay with things needing improvement, then and, and then, uh, and we're eventually going to get to the point where we feel increasingly happy with our work. So, shoot, I uh, the pencil is broken here. I could feel it. So it had broken, it looked like it had broken a little bit earlier, probably in the manufacturing, and there's a little bit of adhesive underneath there that was kind of holding it all together. Um, let me take, let me see, do I have one that's already good to go? Which one are you? Okay. All right, I might have to take a little bit of a break to sharpen my pencil. <laughs> That doesn't happen a whole lot in the show. It's one of the reasons I, I sharpen it um, this way as well is because it, um, with so much of the, of the pencil core exposed, um, I don't often have to go back and sharpen it throughout the process of the drawing. So I just have this trash can off here that I'm kind of whittling it into. And rather than give it a sharp point, see what happens. I'm just kind of taking back some of that, that uh, some of that wood to show some of that core. But I'm, I'm just going to leave that 
a big old chunk. It's a big old chunk of charcoal. And it's gonna leave, it's gonna have that sharp edge there. And no matter how much I try, try to lay it flat, it is gonna make these fine lines. So I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to actually sharpen the pencil on the page. So as I work that background and start to build up um, the, some of those values, I'm rolling the pencil and intentionally kind of sharpening it as, as I go. using my palm to wipe that down. I should be using like a paper towel or something, but I don't want to slow down. One thing I, I noticed is that, you know, especially when you're working with charcoal, you know, fingerprints show up pretty easily. And I'm, luckily, luckily this, there's not a lot showing up here, um, but I've had so many, especially when working with graphite, trying to tone a, a section of the drawing and then there's fingerprints where I realize I have not been kind to the paper. <laughs> And so there's just, um, you know, these, all these greasy marks on the page. I know some, some places will kind of insist on kind of working with white gloves to help protect the, the surface. And so that's, an, that's always an option as well. I have never really embraced that just because I, don't, I, I enjoy the feeling of charcoal on my fingers. I could see some of these, I could see some fingerprints there showing up. Um, yeah, mad moments go, yeah, I should have some pencils. I've probably got about a hundred of the charcoal pencils, but they're all down these little little stubs. Like you can see this one here, you know, is getting a little small. Um, in order for me to sharpen it down, I need to take off a couple inches of that and that will leave me a real little little stub. But I got a bunch of the pencils that are sharpened to about this, this amount. In the <laughs> Got to clean house a little bit and gonna start over with a new set of pencils, I think, soon. All right, but you can start to see that it's now filing down on this side and it'll get me a, a nice sharp uh, pencil kind of tip at some point. So that's, you know, generally I would spend probably five or 10 minutes or so sharpening the pencil, getting it how I want it, but. There's no need to have you guys sit and watch me just sharpen pencils. I want to get rid of some of those blotches there. All right, I like to kind of wipe things down as I go, help to unify all the marks on the page. Um, and then gonna build the image back up, wipe it down, build it back up, wipe it down. Each time you do that, you get to a, a, a kind of deeper level of specificity in the work. It's the same process I use for painting. So kind of laying down marks, kind of smoothing it up, laying down more and then gradually refining. Um, kind of indicate the top of the head. Indicate the bottom of the chin there. What are we doing on time? We're about 40 minutes in. We're making some good progress. All right. so. Um, so I, I feel pretty good about the overall uh, zones that I've created for the features. And as we talked about, there's a basic proportion. If we take the distance from the chin to the, the center, the, the bridge of the nose should be equivalent as that distance to the top of the head. And then that same distance is, equiv uh, is equivalent to the distance between the outer edges of the eyes in, in the reference photo. So. Um, so we've got those major points there. Now we can kind of break this section down a little bit more. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the distance from, let's see, the chin to the bottom of the nose. Let's see, do I wanna do that one? Yeah, so the distance from the chin to the bottom of the nose, from here to bottom of the nose, should be then the same as it as from the bottom of the nose to like the eyebrows. So if the eyebrows are suggested here, the distance from here, chin, to the bottom of the nose, right underneath the, the nostrils there, is the same as from that place, bottom of the nose, to the eyebrows. So let's see if we can 
take a more precise measurement. So that puts you at the bottom of the nose right about here. And that generally there's well, there's a little bit of a shadow that falls in that area. Now, let's see. I'm going to take that same measurement from the bottom of the chin to the bottom of the nose. And that's equivalent to the width of the mouth. So this distance here is equivalent to the width of the mouth. So that allows me to, to place the one side of the mouth over here. Let's see. Another one right here. It feels generally symmetrical there. Um, you know, the, so there are some places that will, uh, you, you, where you can learn some, some of the basic um, pro proportions. So one of the things that makes caricature art work is that many of those artists are really aware of kind of a, an average, an average proportion. Like if you were to take, take everybody you've ever observed and you kind of, you take all their faces, their proportions, put them together to come up with an average and try to be aware of, of something like that. And then you become aware of where each individual deviates from that average, right? And so sometimes it can be helpful to start with that map on the page and then adjust accordingly. Um, and, and so there's, you know, different, um, different artists will kind of have a different set of average proportions but in general, you're looking at you know, place, the placement of the eyes between the chin and the top of the head, um, and then the distance from the chin to the nose to the eyes, um, and then the, the placement between the nose and the chin for the, for the mouth. Um, and then when you're looking at the corner of the mouth, comparing those to the eyes, so like this corner here, for example, really is in line with the pupil. So it's gonna be somewhere around here. And if I take a plumb line here, then this corner is, is line, in line with the pupil over here. So then what that, what we can kind of extrapolate from that is that if we take this distance from the chin to the bottom of the nose, it, that should be that should be equal to the distance between the, the pupils, and it should be equal to the distance between the corners of the mouth, the width of the mouth. And then uh, you know, so if you if you have your own kind of set of proportions that you utilize in your portraits, you know, what are the things that you look for? to help me ensure that the proportions are accurate. I'm really noticing now working with this squared off <laughs> tip of the pencil is kind of a pain. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it's also forcing me to not be too precise. So I'm gonna go with it. Um, can't be precious with these marks right now. Let's see. All right, Rebecca saying proportions are looking good so far. Thank you. Um, oh, and then Isabi, I forgot, I missed your question earlier. This is a 2B that I'm working with right now. Uh, so it's a bit harder in terms of the range of charcoal pencils. Um, and then I have a 6B that I'll be using later for some of the darker details. So this charcoal pencil is gonna get pretty dark, um, but it, you'll, you'll notice there's gonna be a, a distinct difference between this mark and the, uh, the 6B when I bring that out. Um, yes, uh, Rebecca's saying pencil extenders solve that issue. So I, I definitely need to get one of those. I know a lot of colored pencil artists that use those as well because those are so expensive. Uh, so they want to use every bit of that pencil that they can. So I need to get a set of those. Um, Rebecca's saying all those smudges could become part of the tree in the background. Exactly, yeah. I'm going to kind of ignore the background and think about how 
just a basic relationship, just light or dark for that background. And then let the, the marks that I'm building up here, um, just let them go, uh, be a bit more abstract with that. But for you, you may decide that the environment is really critical for the portrait and maybe spend more time in there. But for now, for me, at least I'm gonna ignore the background for the most part and just think about it in terms of how I can utilize it as contrast for values. Um, and then uh, uh, Cubs Winnet says, her face seems a little more narrow in the reference. Yeah, I, that's a, I'm gonna have to keep coming back to that. Um, so one of the things that I, I often will suggest to students is to kind of think about um, working from the inside out, right? So we started by establishing an overall shape of the head. Now we're starting to map the features and now we gotta go back out and I need to be flexible with that initial shape that I established for that head. Because as I get these proportions nailed down, I'm gonna to have to adjust those. Um, now, I'm, you know, I'm glad you mentioned something about the, the head feeling too, it, it narrower in the reference. That's something that, that happened to me um, in the preparatory sketch is that I, um, I had drawn her face too wide. And so I'm gonna keep kind of evaluating that, but it's, gonna, it's amazing how subtle um, it, that can be. You know, the slight change and um, along that outer edge can make a big difference in how we interpret things. So, um, but keep, um, keep throwing out those observations as we go, because it's really helpful for me to, um, to become aware of those things. So if you're new um, and you're seeing people make comments like, you know, the eyes are too big or whatever, that's, we're asking for that here. That's what this whole show is about, is to have, we kind of work together on this, and you all have helped me tremendously in the past um, improve my drawing. So I welcome those observations. Okay, just kind of shaking things off a little bit. Um, Monica saying the eyes are the hardest things for me to or you have to do. Yeah, they. Um, oh, and the Tammy is saying they have drawing gloves with most fingers exposed. That's interesting. I got to check those out. Um, yeah, the the eyes are tricky. <laughs> we we put so much emphasis. I mean, it, it's it's a, a natural reaction for us. I mean, we as I was alluding to earlier, you know, we we as humans have uh, developed a keen, um, I don't know, high level of observation on the features. We, we give a lot of emphasis on the, the face, you know, the, the slightest twinge in the eye, you know, the, a, a slight upturn in the mouth or a downturn. Uh, we, we read people that way. You know, we, it's, it's communicating at a distance, right? We can look at somebody um, and as in some sort of empathic response, um, anticipate what they're experiencing internally. Um, and it all has to do with the, these micro expressions that, um, that we observe. And that to me is what makes portrait drawing and painting so hard is because, um, you know, the, the slightest change to the shape of the eye can totally change the expression. Um, and especially, you know, especially with the eyes, you know, we, we give a lot of, uh, we place a lot of importance on them. Uh, so I'm trying to keep my eyes still blurred as I look, um, as I look at it. Um, and my, my challenge, the thing that I always struggle with the most is I tend to draw the eyes too large, which makes sense is because we, the, the things that are more important to us tend to take up more of our consciousness, and thus we tend to draw them larger than they actually are. Um, and so it's kind of an instinct that I have to fight. All right, so I'm gonna, I, I'm, I'm still trying to get closer in terms of narrowing down the, the, the field within which these features will, are, are, you know, are present, but, um, I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm ready to place the pupil there now. It looks like she's looking off into some weird direction, and part of that is because my 
pencil's not as precise as I'd like it to be, but um, but yeah, I tend to draw the eyes too large, um, so I want to try to be aware of that. I try to be aware of the things that you know, the common habits that I have to break. Um, and it's something that I, I'm interested in talking with other artists about is, you know, what are the, what are the things that you find yourself doing, uh, you know, over and over again that you have to keep fighting with each, each work? It's one of the things that um, I remember watching a documentary on uh, a Leonardo image as they're trying to authenticate it. I believe it was on PBS, a Nova episode. And one of the things they did to help um, help with that, uh, that authentication was to bring in an, uh, an expert draftsman who, um, well, she, well she, she studied the marks of the, um, of, the, of the work and recreated that and really understanding the mind of the person who created that and looking at some of the, the the, the, the corrections in particular, like where are those, where are the things that, that, that Leonardo would have had to correct throughout the process? And is that consistent with other images? And so she, she showed us how uh, in, in all these other um, authenticated Leonardo's, there's the same set of mistakes being repeated. He's correcting the, I think like the, the angle of the chin or something just slightly. And it just makes me think about that too. There's lots of things that I find myself making the same mistakes over and over again each drawing but then correcting them and it, be, it becomes kind of muscle memory at some point um, but to me that gets exciting because it's, you know that tells me something about Leonardo you know to see um, you know to see those those corrections you know or I, I think about you know what it be would it be like to, to see the the sketchbooks of or, no, or the, the not the sketchbooks but the um, kind of the rough drafts of like Bob Dylan songs or something like that. And you say, what's, what words were initially placed and then corrected or not corrected, but a, a kind of adjusted or cut all together, right? You learn so much by those, those decisions, those editorial decisions. So some of these marks I need to, some of these marks are starting to get a little distracting. So I'm going to, Try to smooth things out a little bit, like some of these marks that I made here that a little bit heavier in the eyebrow than I intended. Um, and it's, I could start to become sensitive to those now and, and clean those up. Alinda is saying, when I narrow the face of a child, it tends to make the child older. Keeping the roundness of the child's face is a trick. What is that trick? <laughs> Interesting, yeah. Um, and then Isabi saying, true, I draw the heads larger. Yes. Um, yeah, like it, it's one of the things that I remember learning about, you know, like especially with, when you observe children's drawings, um, you know, often they're more symbolic than literal. And so if they're drawing a group of people, for example, they may draw the most important person to them as larger than other figures, even if, even if physically that person isn't larger than others in the group. So, and I, I, I feel like there's still part of me that does that. Um, All right, what do I need to do here? I think I need to spend a little bit of time on here. This, I'm kind of regretting working on an eight by 10 size now. <laughs> I wish I had worked a little bit larger um, because the smaller you go, the, the proportionally the greater the, the errors in the drawing, right? I, I mean, if I'm off by an eighth of an inch here, that's that's a big difference than being off on an eighth by an eighth of an inch on a much larger drawing, um, and so I, I feel the pressure to be more precise now. So 
And I need to place the corners the, the, the nostrils, the edges of the nostrils a little bit. Um, so if I understand the bottom of the nose is somewhere down here. I'm going to try to essentially do some negative drawing. I want to try to arrive at the shape of the nose by spending more time observing the shape, the space around it, than the nose itself, and see if that helps to uh, be a bit more accurate. So we'll just kind of play around with that. And it's, it's good to have that, this overhead projection visible um, because the way the light is bouncing off the paper, um, things look one way from this perspective and different when I see it on the screen. And so some of these, you know, some of these things that it feels like a nice soft transition in value and I look up at the screen and it's this bold edge that I need to get rid of. And right now, really all of the marks that I'm making right now are utilizing the weight of the pencil. I'm hardly applying any pressure. And I'm just trying to sneak up on these uh, features, these proportions. And again, just gonna now trying to focus more on, uh, on the, the structure around the features rather than the features themselves. You know, one of the instincts that I had to break early on um, is, when, especially when drawing the eyes, is that my instinct was to draw an outline around the shape of the eye, um, and that would make everything just feel too heavy. So now I'm trying to, trying to be much more sensitive to those edges. Right. Nell R is saying my girl looks like 16, huh? I'm just gonna do a little bit of erasing here to try to, to see if that helps. Um, in particular, right in here. And I'm kind of thinking ahead to when I start to add the white, where those highlights are going to be. But I need this to help, I think, to create a little bit of contrast there. Uh, and, and as as I move down to the mouth, I'm trying to observe the shape of the light and the shadow, not necessarily the features. So down here, for example, there's a shape of light that crosses over the lip and onto the, the kind of the lower lip there. And that's what I'm looking at. Those those so shadow shapes, those light shapes. And what's kind of cool is I can start to see an expression forming and that expression seems to, seems to be moving in the right direction for what I'm, what I'm looking for. So it's a really gentle touch with the Needed eraser. Let's see how that let's see how that works. It generally is creating a um, a, a nice shadow structure. Uh, kind of knock that down intentionally so that I, I don't start to confuse this with a highlight. So I'm going to make sure I knock this whole side down into shadow. And the same, I'm trying to keep that same thinking 
when I get to the features here in terms of that light. Think about the, sh the, the shadow shapes, the light shapes, more than the features. Um, we'll see how that works. I say it's hard to I want to get right in there and I don't want to block the shot. So <laughs> trying to trying to get close, but hopefully not in such a way that it makes it difficult for you to see what I'm doing. Um, so, so this mark here, even though it's very subtle, is a bit distracting. All right, just focusing a little bit. I'm trying to, trying to, trying to focus so I'm not quite as chatty right now. But um, I do want to check the chat, to see if there's any questions, any observations. Um, so I kind of erased the, that light on the lower eyelid a little bit, but it's it's kind of slanted wrong. It's too heavy and it's distracting so i think what i need to do is switch to the um switch to this uh blending stump here um reality discovery how long does a drawing like this take well we're doing this in real time so my goal is to get this done in two hours total so we're about halfway through about an hour in um but the again the process that we we try to um, focus on for this show is when we're building up the whole drawing at once so that it you can kind of be in control of how much detail you want to add. Um, so ideally, you know, I'd be able to stop at any point and recognize it as a portrait. Um, but then if you feel compelled to create more uh, detail, you can sit with it longer um, it's you know the time the time is what it is in a way that you know like we I would always envy the artists that could stick with a drawing longer because I would just I would tend to work so quickly I get a little, <laughs> a little rushed and and I'd be happy and it'd be nice to get be done with my drawing quickly but um, I, I would always kind of Feel like I, I kind of I should have st stuck with the, the subject a little bit longer. So I've been working on developing patience for that a little bit more. So with the blending stump, I'm starting to kind of smooth things out a little bit. Um, you know, and some of the hatch marks in the charcoal get a little bit dense, and so I want to smooth those out if they're not serving me. Um, and I'm trying to think through the overall structure of the head. Um, and so one thing that might be helpful for you at this stage is to um, just think about the direction of your marks with regards to the cross contour. So the cross contour, the marks that are inside, like on, on the surface of a three-dimensional object that help you define the structure of that object. So the contour marks represent the outer edges of a three-dimensional object, the cross contour are the marks on that surface within the outer edges that you can utilize. And so if we look at the structure of the head, you know, we have, you know, we have some light here, for example. Um, you have that shape of the cheek, and then things kind of change direction as you, as you move up the side and the nose, around the top of the nose. Um, and so you might think about the direction of the marks and ask yourself, is it helping with that form and structure or, or not. Um, and I can see like there's some there's some blotches here and this is one of the, the tricky spots and things that I, I learned in doing the preparatory preparatory sketch is that 
you know, in some drawings, having some sort of kind of blotchy surface is not going to really cause much trouble. Like if I'm working on the background, I can can have all sorts of weird marks back there. But um, with with a portrait, uh, the the viewer can may represent may interpret some of those blotches as facial features, as creases and things like that. So I've kind of lost the, the chin here, that's all right. I'll try to reestablish that. Okay, let's see. So in this way, I'm starting to add a little bit of detail. And I'm intentionally, I'm kind of dodging and weaving through the drawing, making some observations, work on the nose for a little bit, um, work on the eyes, move back to the nose, move over to lips, um, and not get stuck in, in, in one spot too long. And, and one of the things that hopefully is becoming apparent now is that, you know, our our minds are starting to fill in a lot of information. You know, I I don't know how much is actually missing right now in the facial features, like in the eyes, for example. We recognize them as eyes, and so that I don't need to be all that explicit with them. I can let these marks be soft and abstract, suggest them, and let the viewer's mind fill in any missing information. Um, kind of right now, I'm trying to think about the, uh, the shadow shapes more than anything. Think about the, the structure of light and shadow. Um, I feel like the eyes are working out okay. Um, the nose is problematic at this point. So I'm going to give myself, I'm going to give a little bit of attention to that. Let's see, what do I need to do? Okay, so I, I'm going to keep in thinking with what, I, what I was just talking about and kind of trust the the process of looking at the the shape of light and shadow. So I'm gonna I'm gonna switch to observing the light shapes, and then and as well as the shadow shapes there. Now Art is saying, I love how you don't do lines and you can see the figure coming out with shapes. Oh, I'm glad that's um, connecting for you. Um, yeah, I, but it's something that I'm continually working on and it's helpful to be able to kind of voice it, right? And kind of commit myself to it because there is that instinct to go with lines at this stage, so. Um, it's a bit of a crutch for me to do this live because I feel like if I say it to you all, then it I have to uh, I have to follow through with that and um, kind of trust that process. So um, But the use of line versus mass, I think is really an important an important thing to be in control of. you know and, and it's hard because, it's such an instinct for us to, to draw lines, right? It, we, what we do when we first start making marks is we draw lines that represent things. And, um, uh, 
and so often we, should, we don't even really think about it. We, that's just how we do it. And so having some sort of awareness on that can be really helpful. And it being a conscious choice when to use line. So I'm still using the blending stump and you can see that it's just loaded with charcoal. So I can get, I can get quite a bit um, kind of established just using this as a drawing tool. And I really like using it for features because it's a bit more gentle than the harsh um, charcoal pencils here. Um, yeah, there's, I think there's, there's a reason why I don't do a lot of portraits and painting. <laughs> It's really hard. Um, I really admire uh, portrait painters and drawers and sculptors. Like anybody who deals with a portrait, man, that is, this is, I feel like there's so much at stake. You know, what I love about, you know, landscapes is that you can be a bit more free. You can kind of lock on to the feeling of being in that space and, and um, try to capture that. But, you know, it's, you can move things around if you need to, or, you know, you can, uh, I don't know, you can, yeah, there's a bit more flexibility in that, in the landscape, I feel like sometimes. Um, even though I like to think of, of, of landscapes as portraits, you know, portraits of places. So for me, getting, getting proportions generally right is, is helpful, but if I'm off, it doesn't, doesn't creep people out. If I'm off on a portrait, it creeps me out at least. So I'm going to smooth this out. I've got this, this um, reflected light being established here, and I feel like it's a bit too strong. And instead of instead of it being physically lighter, I want to darken the space around it to create that. Um, so as I'm as I'm working in this area here, I see some contrast and values where it gets a little bit darker underneath the nostril and in, in the in the nostrils themselves, for example. Um, but rather than lighten at this stage, what I want to do is now go darker in those areas. And then if this value is too dark for those lighter areas, then I can lift that out. Um, but I want to, I want to first kind of lay in some of the darker areas. So just these really soft kind of circular marks uh, and it's really tricky here because there's a tooth to the paper that making this odd shape that I don't like. And then come over here. This is all very light, so I don't want to get too dark there. Um, kind of work my way underneath the nostril. And then, you know, the noses are such really interesting forms. This is, uh, I think we're gonna have to sharpen this. need a little bit more precision. And there's a bit of adhesive it looks like in on that on the charcoal that is disrupting things. Normally I just like to power through issues with medium with the materials. Because sometimes sometimes little flaws can actually lead to some really cool things. But um, so I, I have it sharpened down. It's not Incredibly sharp, but a little bit more precise now. And I want to start to map out the shape of the nose. Um, so what do I want to do here? I think that the, you know, the, the key to drawing the features lies somewhere in 
delicacy of Marx is kind of where I'm, what I'm thinking right now. <laughs> because I feel like when I, when I struggle with the features, it always comes down to generally just being overhanded, um, or heavy-handed, I mean. And, and so I, I'm going to intentionally just be more gentle than I, um, than I might otherwise be. So... And so what I'm looking at as I go through this is really that particular shape. So you have this general shape where you have these, these curves on either side, and then you get this kind of wave-like form here. Um, I want to try to be a bit more kind of precise with that um, because it's so easy with the features to rely on that symbol system, those preconceived notions of how, about how things should be drawn. Um, so as I, as I'm, right now I'm actually, I'm actually working the nose. I'm drawing the eye, <laughs> but I'm working on the nose um, because I'm trying to keep uh, everything in context of one another. And so I realize that as I'm making these marks, as I'm making these marks down here, I want to be aware of how everything stacks up with the, the other features. And so I'm not drawing the, the entire eye, but I'm trying to find the, that inner, the inner kind of the, the inner corner of that eye, and see how it aligns with with the nose. Let's see. Claude is saying your predecessor John Nagy started a TV show. That's right. I remember John watching some of those shows when I was. I didn't know about it till I watched kind of uh, replays of it online. I remember, but, but seeing those a while back. Um, Wow, that's a crazy. So just adding that little dark mark, it recontextualizes the values a little bit, and it made her features feel really pale. It's one of the, the things I love most about focusing on value is, is that, again, we're always calibrating to values. And, and I know we're working on that tone paper, and so I can feel everything kind of adjusting around that. Um, one of the things that I have that's really helpful is I have this raised lip here on my drawing table. It gives me a little bit of support. And then... But I, I think in general, kind of going back to the... kind of reflecting on the, the things that I've struggled with most and where things tend to to be problematic for me it generally comes down to me being overhanded over aggressive uh, heavy-handed and and over aggressive with some of the marks so I'm tr really trying to do my best to be um, gentle and deliberate um, so adding only only and kind of sneaking up on it so they only add what I really need uh, rather than start with a heavier mark, that then I have to um, kind of walk back and make more delicate. Okay, so now now that I've I've kind of given some anchors here, my awareness is still really on the nose. That's still the the spot that I'm trying to emphasize. But I realized, you know, I can't really do that unless I um, am happy with the you know the, the other features as well we got to work those all together at the same time 
So now I can move down to the mouth. Um, and one of the other things too that uh, I learned this from Christy Gordon. Uh, she's a really great portrait artist, figure artist, and she filmed a series with us, uh, a one drawing, a uh, portrait painting um, lessons from um, John Singer Sargent. So she's doing a, some John Singer Sargent copies, and she did one with Rembrandt, and then she did this series on portraits good to great. So how to, like, what are the, com some common um, issues that artists face when drawing portraits and then how does she address them? And one of the things that I, I have her voice running in my head right now is has to do with the lips. You know, we have a tendency to, to draw hard, hard lines around where the lips are. But if you look at this, especially if you squint your eyes, um, it's all very, very subtle, very soft, especially around those edges, around the corners of the mouth. And so um, it becomes a little bit heavier here in the center in this case, and then generally the upper lip falls into shadow. Uh, and the, the lower lip catches the light. Now in this case, you can see it's very, it's very difficult to see where the kind of the, where the lip is and the lower lip kind of meet. There was that, that line around the lips, so I don't want to be, I need, just need to be really gentle here. Actually, I feel like the tooth of the paper is a bit of a problem, so I'm going to... Do this. So I guess when it, when it comes down to it, this whole portrait is all about delicacy. It's about being, being delicate with the marks. Tom Swober saying, when I was 10 or 11, I was given a John Nagy drawing kit. That's awesome. That was great. I, uh, you know, I, you know, here's some, sometimes people knock artists like Bob Ross or things like that. And Yet I know far more people that are artists now that were inspired by people like that. You know, that they say this is, that's what got me started. And I definitely remember watching those shows on PBS. And I'm glad to see that Bob Ross has kind of found a, a second life lately. I see his stuff everywhere. Um, so what am I doing here? So when it comes down to, I've got the corner of the mouth that's relatively dark. And I'm gonna, I'm using the, the blending stump to draw that. Again, it's a bit more gentle, uh, a bit more gentle than the charcoal. I think I might have to bring in the, the white charcoal soon. So, so now you can see is I just affected her age. <laughs> you can see, I, as I'm uh, capturing some of those lines in there around the mouth, um, all of a sudden she just seemed to get older when I did that, or at least her mouth did. Um, So I want to just kind of smooth these out, things out here a little bit. It's a little blotchy in some of these areas. And I typically, I don't really worry about that. So it's, it's kind of a fun experience for me right now to, to spend a little time really just smoothing and blending. But I feel like it's important. Really just focusing on these subtle value shifts. And so if you're looking to create kind of a smoother area and it's really difficult because some of the marks that you're using to kind of lay down in any of those hatch marks, 
if they become too heavy. So for example, it feels like right in here, there's a dot that's a bit too dark. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna fill in the area around it. And that's typically the way I, I address it first. Rather than try to lift it with the eraser, I'm gonna fill in the light spots around it and then try to smooth that out. Because then what I can do, is I need to go darker here anyways, in that underneath the chin. Um, but if, if, again, if you're getting stuck in some of those areas where you need to just make it smoother, but those hatch marks are showing up too strongly, target the light areas, fill it in a little bit, smooth it out, and then if it's too dark, lift up the whole thing, try to erase out the, the larger area. I'm gonna be careful with my marks here. I wanna be careful of those directional marks. I kinda of like the, the atmosphere that's forming in this drawing right now, so I may play with that a little bit more. And just kind of be selective in where, where the, the face seems to kind of emerge out of this fog, out of the light there. All right, Tammy and Mad Moments Go. Oh, Thomas, you're saying I was about to point out that using a stump as a drawing tool can help you keep your lines and values soft and gentle. Excellent. Yeah, I, if, you're, if you're new, I, I I think I've seen you, your name here before, Thomas, but yeah, I kind of, the, the blending stump is a tool that I came to late in my, in my career. Um, I always struggled with it and I, I just kind of, I left it out of my, uh, my drawing kit for a long time because I don't think I had a, really a clear understanding of how to use it. In my mind, it was simply a tool to blend things and I and make things just smooth and I never really cared for that much. I would try to just use use the charcoal itself or the eraser, use my technique to create smooth transitions rather than introduce a new tool. Uh, but it was during the, the process of this show where I, I picked it up again. I thought, well, let me let me give this a shot. And I realized that what I was um, what I was kind of being held back from was that the, um, the blending stump is a great way to make marks. I need to, it's a great way to contribute to the form. Um, and when I thought of it that way, where it's not just about smoothing, but it's a, it's a mark making tool, then it opened up a lot of doors for me. So, um, kind of just refining things along that edge a little bit. Um, and now I'm gonna, I'm kind of asking myself how much more detail I need in the eyes. Um, I'm gonna need to do a little bit more work here in the mouth. It's amazing what these subtle shifts can do. And so I, I think the other thing that I would, I, I struggle with, and I'm again, I'm kind of saying it out loud so that I hold myself accountable, is sticking with um, something longer. I think there, there was always part of me that would want to finish the drawing and get to that point of finish. And so I would, whether it was conscious or subconscious, I would kind of ignore issues that I knew, know needed to be addressed. And I, I think it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about how I would admire, I would admire the artists that would really take their time because I would be in such a rush just to get it done. Um, because there's such a, a feeling of satisfaction when you're when you're, you've done a, a drawing that you're happy with, that I would I would want to get to that feeling so quickly, but then I, I wouldn't really be happy with the work. So I, like, but I so I have to force myself to slow down, and so I'm kind of again holding myself accountable here, saying that I need to continually address these things and try not to accept them as finished before they're ready. So it may seem like, you know, we're just spending all this time just drawing and redrawing the mouth, and that's exactly what we're doing. And then just minor changes to see how that 
impact things. All right, so I think I need to get the need to get this jawline established a bit more. So kind of working back and forth up to that edge and back so that I don't have a, a hard line there. Give some sort of indication of her shirt so that it doesn't feel like she's just this disembodied head and just because it's creepy. There, some sort of indication of at least the, that she has more to her than just you know this head floating out of the out of the fog there. Okay. <sighs> JC saying my husband gave me a Bob Ross bobblehead to keep me motivated to always have fun. That's awesome. Um, I, it was cool. He, uh, I, so I, I went to school up in Alaska and I briefly, I taught at the, an air force base up there when, where, uh, he was stationed, I guess. What was the cool thing about him that I learned is that he was, he was like a, you know, relatively high ranking. He was hard. He was in charge of, uh, you know, disciplining people and he was so hard on them. <laughs> Part of what drove his painting was, is he needed to, uh, kind of decompress from the harshness that he, in, that he inflicted upon others. <laughs> he didn't like having to be mean, and uh, uh, that's really cool. Okay. Um, all right. So I think. What am I doing now? Okay, there is. I think there's a little bit more. I need to. I just want to double check the proportions a little bit. I'm kind of giving myself a, a plan at this point. So I'm going to bring out the white, um, the, the white uh, charcoal now and start drawing with that. But I need to see if there's any areas that I need to target. Because what I found that with myself at least, when I start to apply the white, um, it's easy to forget that I still need to adjust proportions in some areas. And so I want to kind of remind myself of that. Okay. So I've got the white and the white charcoal here. And I'm gonna start just with a loose overhand grip, really light pressure, and build up areas where the light is a little bit stronger, but I know I'm gonna reserve the lightest lights for, uh, for later. So now it's, you know, earlier when I was drawing attention to the, the light shapes, I, uh, I was using the eraser to do that and in more of an, a subtractive process. So now um, it's, it's additive. I'm adding the white to it and trying to think about those, the light shapes. Uh, so I need to, I'm gonna keep squinting my eyes. And this is also a, a kind of a way, an effective way of blending too. Um, although with the um, with the with the white charcoal, it when it mixes with the the charcoal from the charcoal pencil, the dark charcoal, um, it can sometimes be very cool, um, and it might contrast against the the natural tone of the paper. So, just something to be kind of aware of. I'm just kind of floating around. Focusing more on this side, more on the light side of the head. Um, and I see some kind of reflections over here, but I'm not going to give them much attention right now. And I feel like her nose, like this upper lip needs to be a little bit larger. So I, mean, I can, can adjust that a little bit. I 
so this this white charcoal can be a really effective way at um, sharpening without being too heavy-handed. Um, so as I observe the light here on the nostril, for example, I can sharpen up that edge uh, and use a very light touch versus using the dark charcoal. If I had done a dark line along here, it could be really heavy, a little bit too strong. If I come over here in the, the shadow side, you can see some bounce light. So I can establish the light on this side of the nostril by just using a very gentle touch in there. Um, and then kind of sharpen up some of the lines in here. And again, it sharpens it without really adding too much weight. If I look under here, there's, the, with the shape of the nose, there's a little bit of light that catches in there. So I missed the shape of the nostril a little bit. So I'll have to work back and forth on that. Um, so right in here though, there's little light that catches on that the edge of the nostril. Um, so one of the things that I also try to um, really pay attention to is this space right in here the shelf underneath the nose. Because you know, we often will emphasize the outer edges of the nostrils and the tip of the nose. Um, and, but if we, can, if we can create that distance from the tip of the nose back to that lip, that can often be what is really essential for creating a sense of form and volume, if that makes sense. Now, so if I'm looking at this, it feels a bit too large feel like I've made her nostrils too small. So it's a little bit, it's pretty easy to make those a little bit larger. And then refine that a bit again. So right now, I was just talking about trying to create that depth, and I don't quite have it yet. So that's what I'm still working on. And now what I want to do is actually, I'm going to switch to this. There's this kind of bounce light along this nostril in here. I think is important to wrapping around into the uh, you know into the, the the lip there. So I'm just trying to spend really more time on that side, that portion of the nose, um, before I pull out the highlight on the nose, which is then going to bring the tip of the nose forward. See, there's so there's a kind of a bump in the paper here that's impacting some of the marks. So uh, you might have to pay attention to the tooth of the paper to see if that's influencing any of the marks that you're making. But again, this isn't. I don't, I don't know if we've really done any drawing so far as part of the show where we're really focused on creating smooth transitions. But I think it's important for for this subject. So. Um, I want to. There's a little bit of light catching here. And so, what I'm thinking about as I make this first kind of pass with the white is the overall kind of shape of the light and shadow. 
more than anything. Um, and then I'm gonna, and I'm kind of giving everything, kind of bringing everything up to one level in terms of that light. And then I'm gonna add the highlights in a little bit, a little bit later. She's got the, this, this area here in the shadow is so tricky because the, the lights on this side, are, they still fall into shadow. Um, but you, once you observe them, there's a, it's so easy to overstate them. Uh, that, that bounce light there. So I want to try to be gentle with it. And then just try to get that corner of the mouth just right. Because this left side here is a little bit, a little bit higher than the right, and it gives her this really interesting expression. So this is a bit slower pace drawing than, than we've, we typically experience here in the show. Uh, so thank you all for sticking with me for this. I know it can, it's a little bit, a little bit more dry, I guess, than, than others, but. So one of the things I'm doing in here is I'm, is I'm trying to smooth and blend with the white charcoal as well as lift the value. So kind of targeting some darker blotches Now I'm going to come around here. Now I want to add the light, the highlights on the lips. I think that'll help to give it some form. So how's everybody else's doing? Uh, let me see. Actually, I missed a. Oh my gosh, there's a bunch of comments that came in. So, <laughs> uh, let me get, let's see. Thank you for the comments, everybody. Um, Donna saying I took an art for beginners online class. I tried my best, but was too embarrassed to post anything for the class to view, as I was the only one who'd not graduated from artist college. Well, I'm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that is definitely something that I can connect with. And I suspect many of us here can as well. And that's one of the things we talk about on this, this show is like we have the mindset here, at least I, I try to promote, is that you know this is not the only drawing we're ever gonna do, right? We're gonna be doing lots and lots of drawing. It's about building a healthy habit. And so if you get to, if you do a drawing and you just, you don't wanna share it, you don't have to share it. Right, um, and then hopefully you get to the point where you you do feel comfortable, um, and then um, and also when you can when you find um, a person or people that you can you can go to for feedback that can be really valuable um, because and, and you know often we want to show our our work to the people that we're close to but. Sometimes those people haven't had much experience looking at art or talking about it or giving constructive feedback. And so um, it can be helpful to not set that expectation for yourself, you know, and, you know um, and put that pressure on somebody who may feel on the spot to make comments about things that they don't really know. And it's one of those things where, you know, art is, we can have a visceral reaction to, and, and it can be difficult to then articulate that um, so sometimes we get visceral reactions from people and and we can internalize that but it's easy to take things personally um, and really what's helpful is um, you know it may be more helpful to have more constructive feedback so you know what to do the next time but 
So I'm just going, again, kind of staying on this side. You know, it, it kind of occurs to me too, one of the things we talk about is, again, I mentioned at the top of the show that, that you know, I love the idea that marks are thoughts. You know, so that every mark that we make originates as a thought. Um, and then as by the same token, the marks that we make can influence our thoughts. And so I find myself being more precise in this drawing than with most others. Some days I just have the, the desire to be kind of free and expressive with my mark making. Um, and in some days I just have the, the, the desire to be more precise. Um, and you sometimes using the drawing process as a way to bring myself into focus uh, when I feel scattered. Um, okay, so I know I, I'm gonna, I can get even lighter on this. You can see if I hold the white of the pencil, see how much brighter that is in the highlights. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna move over to the shadow side some more, and I'm gonna use this as a tool for blending a bit. And I wanna keep the marks really light. You know, I, I want this to read as bounce light. And if I overstate it, then I'm going to confuse the viewer. It's gonna, the, the form is not gonna feel as well understood as it could. So there's a little bit of bounce light coming in from this side. So I'm trying to observe that shape in here. Uh, and it gets really much stronger right in here in the, on the cheek. So I'm using the soft, this overhand grip, really soft circular marks so that I don't have a strong directionality. I kind of smooth that out. Uh, right in here, it gets a little unorganized. And then here there's a little bounce light kind of catching along the edge. So I'm going to smooth out some of these darker marks right in here. And then really feather it out. under the chin. So it's almost like I'm using the, the tool at this point as a, as a blending and gradation tool more than anything. And I do want to come back in on this, make this a little bit darker. But not right up to that edge. This is all about these gentle marks. So this is a great way to develop kind of a sense of touch with the material. Um, like I said, I, I have a tendency to be a little heavy handed. Um, and so I'm intentionally lightening up. So there's this, this mark here, there's like a flaw in the paper or something, which is unfortunate that is right there on her nose. So I, gotta, I wanna get rid of that. Um, there we go. Now I'm just looking at this structure in here, and I will we'll work back and forth between the white charcoal and the black charcoal to make it work. And you know, there's again, there's some kind of some blotchiness in areas that I want to make sure it's serving the drawing. But don't be afraid to kind of try something out. If you don't like it, take it out of the drawing.
mouth. I've got the corner of my mouth, and you know, the, it, it, I think in general, it's best to be, you know, have smoother and softer transitions around the edges than than hard ones. So right now she's got I kind of overdid her smirk maybe, um, and it. I don't know, it almost feels like this little joker smile, which I don't really care for. So this is where we get into the really the fine, the fine details. Um, let's see. It might be that there's just too much variation. And it's one of those things where I look at it from here and it looks all right, and then I look at it in the overhead projection and it's a little, a little bit heavy. Um, so if you haven't, really step back from your work. Um, uh, that, there's that mark again. There's that flaw on the paper that uh, it, it grabs that charcoal. And it's an unfortunate placement. So what do I want to do here? Uh, I see some comments there that I want to get to, but I also want to keep the drawing going. <laughs> um, to smooth this out that really is bugging me it's usually that doesn't like if it was anywhere else really it'd be all right you could try to hide it but that little that little flaw on the paper is troublesome okay um Uh, Thomas, you got some great comments in there. I, I don't have time to get to all of them, but thank you for sharing those. Um, and it also helps to exaggerate the eyes. Yeah, that can be, that's where caricature artists do such a great job with that. Um, I, you know, I have a hard time, I have a hard time doing that. It just, it's definitely takes practice to do it right. All right, so I'm going to get into the eyes now. How are we doing on time? We're about two hours in total. Actually, you know what I want to do? So I'm gonna I'm gonna get the highlights in first. So I'm gonna get that light on the eyeball. The white of the eye is established. Kind of doing some negative drawing. So starting with a light pressure first, and gradually making it more, gradually making it heavier. Um, let's see. Yeah, so there's that along this this that that lower eyelid is really soft. It's a soft transition at the corners there. And then for that upper eyelid, I'm gonna focus on where the light is strongest. So it's just, it's wrapping over the sphere. So we, the light is stronger right in here and it falls into shadow. And then we have that crease and it falls into shadow and then there's light up here again. Just trying to sneak up on some of these details. I think in general, when you see creases, things like that, I would just ignore them um, because it's it's overstating those details uh, that can really then age the subject. And again, it helps me to say that out loud so that I can <laughs> be 
be accountable for that because I I feel myself wanting to get in there and do all the little the little reflections on, on light there underneath the eye. Um, then right here, the light catches along that edge. And we transition, we travel into the inner part of the eye. It gets a little strong in here. I want to smooth things out first. Um, let's see. I'm working that the light on the cheek here. make nice smooth transitions there. So in this case, I'm targeting some of the darker marks and lightly kind of countering them by, by lightening them. Again, so this stage is more more about blending than anything. Let's see. Now I come down here. Yeah, it gets really. It should get lighter here. I need to, now. So now that yeah, I've kind of got a an average layer of light, I can um, on the light side. I'm going to pull out the brighter highlights. So I can do that by kind of laying on the pressure a little bit more. Here, there's like a little bridge of light that catches along that, that lower lip here. Um, and then it's right here. And under here. And I'm intentionally using an overhand grip here because it helps me to, to control the pressure. Um, and it keeps me sharpening the, the pencil as I go. Oh, that works all right. Now I need to move up to the nose. I need to bring the whole thing up, make it lighter. And where are the highlights? The highlights, really it's strongest right on this side. And on this side of the nostril. So I need to look at the, that overhead projection. The light is catching it differently. Um, and so it's, it's increasing the contrast a little bit from what I see down in here. Um, all right. So now having done the highlights on the eyes, I, I can go back in later and add the darks, but I want to First, I want to create the form through this, the addition of the light. And so here on this one, in this eye that's in the shadow, you can see there's a little bit of light catching on the, at the top part of that rounded part of the eye there. And then it's definitely stronger under here. So what is that shape? Um,
and I'm going to draw a little bit of, I'm going to refine the, the iris a little bit. And then there's a nice light, nice highlight there, right on the, right there on top of the pupil. And now from there, I can, I can refine that. I can darken the, the pupil. I can refine the, the eyelashes a little bit, add, add a little depth to some of those darks. But it can be helpful to have the, the light in there first. Um, and then, then just be really selective in where you add the darker darks. Our eye, that just seems really intense. I don't know if it's the camera. When I, when I look at it in the, the, from the camera's view here on the screen, it feels a bit higher contrast than what I'm seeing in real life. So it's kind of throwing me off a little bit. So I need to, um, I don't know, I need to look at that screen a little bit more. And just working that crease. Uh, yeah, knock that down. I think I need. I think it was a little, little too, too much contrast there. So I'm just kind of smudging things out a little bit, trying to be a little bit more delicate with this stuff. Then. Um, okay. And if you're stuck on the with the eyes, it can be really helpful to, you know, similar to what I was mentioning earlier, to put more emphasis on the structure around it than than the eye itself. You know, so really focus on the the, the creases there, the shape of the shadow, and and then let the um, yeah let the eye be formed out of that structure. I think, gosh, we're a little, we're two hours in. Um, I'll keep working if everybody wants me to keep going. How's everybody feeling? Art Prof, creating critique. First time here, does he take questions from the live chat? Yes, I do. So feel free to ask any questions here. Um, I will do my best to answer them or, you know, some of us here in the, um, in, in, the in the audience there can, can answer as well. We try to, that's why we're drawn together. Um, So if you have any questions, let me know. I'll do my best to answer them. So now I'm just adding a little bit of clarity to some of these areas. And um, I think what I need to do is everything, everything feels a little bit blown out on the, on the, the screen, but I think it's a, a pretty accurate depiction. I want to switch, switch to the, the, the hair, the jawline, things like that. So I'm going to move to this overhand grip. Um, and try to capture the overall form of that, that hair. I don't need to be super explicit, but I think it'll help to, um, to ex ex kind of expand the tonal range a little bit in this. Um, and at the same time, I'm kind of looking back and forth between the reference image and the drawing to see if anything kind of stands out. Because, you know, I feel like it's it's one of those things where, uh, looking at this now, I feel like it's, I almost feel like I'm, I'm doing a portrait of this girl's sister, <laughs> right? Or something, or, uh, you know, another family member. Like, it, and like oh, it resembles her, but it's not quite it. And I don't know exactly why, but that's the nature of this, right? We're here to practice, and I'll try to ex explore that a little bit. And, 
Um, but I kind of, since I said earlier that I want to hold myself accountable and stick with some of these finer areas, um, that, and so to, to really kind of nail it. But, So as I, as I work on this, I'm, I'm using an overhand grip intentionally because it's really effective at creating beautiful fine lines that feel more natural. It works great for hair. Um, and so when you're, when you're thinking about it, you know, think about the way the hair flows and look for the larger structures in that hair rather than drawing each you know, individual you know, hair. Uh, you want to think about the overall structure first. As I'm working here, the other thing, the other thing that I, I struggled in the past before as well is making that jawline too clear, too sharp. Um, and, and that's in particular one area where it can start to feel like we're, it's a mask more than a, a person. You know, if, if our goal here is to create a drawing that, that in some way makes us feel like we're looking at this person, then, uh, you know, we, we don't want it to feel like we're looking at a mask of this person. <laughs> like, because that, that's really uncomfortable. I'm going to drop that value down a little bit. Um, so breaking up that edge, using some sort of lost and found edge along that jawline can be really helpful with that. And then trying to tie everything together. So even, even right here where I have this loose suggestion of the shirt, the shoulders, the, 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 the collar there, um, it can be enough to convince the, the viewer's mind that you know, this is a, a person that we're observing. Um, all right, thank you for the comments, everybody. Um, I'm feeling more confident with these than, than in the past. Um, here's another trick for the hair. So I have my, um, my eraser here, my rubber eraser. Um, and I have it sharpened down to this fine point. So this can be really an effective way at kind of lifting up some of these areas. And, and try to vary your marks so we don't end up with a series of stripes. But um, it's, a, it's a subtractive technique that can be helpful when creating hair. And um, especially if you need to work in the shadow area, um, there's some kind of lighter areas. You can pull out some of these finer marks. And if you're kind of gentle with the rubber eraser, it can, all, it can serve as a blending tool. So if right in here, for example, it'll lift some, but you can also blend with it a little bit. Um, and so as, as I'm working here along the edge, I can use this as a way to break up that edge and observe the shapes of light and shadow. You know, it look here at the, the hair and the bangs and um, you know, with the curls there, you, each kind of lock has a structure of light and shadow. You know, there's light catching along the top, uh, and it falls into shadow. Kind of erase out that little curl. There's something off on this. And I feel like it is it has to have something to do with the shape of the head up here. So I'm going to kind of work both of those areas. You know, the, I'm going to work both positively and subtractively to expand that. So maybe if I switch to this, the white the white charcoal pencil, I can start to kind of pull out some of those highlights. So just focusing on the areas where the light is the strongest. 
So just using an overhand grip, I'm kind of rolling the pencil as I drag along and it creates these really nice fine lines. And so I'm trying to focus on, on areas where, and the, the hair where, where the light is a little bit stronger. And you can do a lot just by suggesting the hair with these kind of fine lines, but getting the light and shadow structure right. How do I feel about that? Um, so I might, I might need to keep working this, but um, I feel like that's working out all right. And back to this one, got some hair missing. So, but the, the trick is to not, you don't want it to be, you don't want there to be stripes in the hair. So vary your marks and really try to observe the, the changing direction of you know, the hair. So you know, I might just make a, a few marks and then move on to another spot to try to prevent myself from falling into a rhythm of those marks. It's so easy to do. We've kind of talked about that here, that something I struggle with. And so we're still using the, the 2B pencil, which is still pretty light comparatively. So let me switch to the 6, see what happens. Hopefully it doesn't blow out the contrast, right? And uh, hopefully it's not too dark. But it's amazing what it's doing to that shadow side of the head now. Um, I, I could feel that I was kind of calibrating to the value range on the screen. So now expanding that by adding these darks. Um, it really changes things quite a bit. And then working with the hair in this overhand grip, I think it can be helpful to um, practice both dragging and pushing the pencil. Um, and get a, just get a feel for it. I like this little curl here, kind of a fun mark there. And I'm trying to draw it as a shape rather than a line that we're then filling in. So now everything else feels really washed out. I felt like the contrast was too, in, too great. It was kind of too punchy earlier, but now that I've added the darks, Everything else feels a little bit more washed out. So where can I be selective with the darks here? Um, so rather than kind of fill in that whole pupil, I'm just trying to be really selective. Um, And add a little bit more of her lashes. Be gentle with those. So again, you don't want them to be like these stripes kind of radiating out from her eyes. It suggests them more than anything. Use that power of suggestion. here in the lips and see how that works if I add that dark. All right. I think I want to use a line selectively right in here to try to define that, that chin. Um, but yeah, I feel like we're, 
I could keep picking away at this. I know we're, we're, we're two and a quarter hours in, so um, you have been with me, with me for a long time. And I think you've seen me do pretty much everything I can do. Is there, if there's an area that you feel like I could, you'd like me to kind of work on a little bit more, if you have additional questions, um, feel free to type those out. Or if you're, if you're kind of waiting for me to get to a certain spot and I've just missed it, um, let me know. And I will stick with this a little bit longer. Um, so right again, right now, I'm just trying to be selective with where I, where I had kind of darker marks here. Um, I think I feel like I can get a little bit darker in here. But this stuff is hard. I don't know about you all, but I'm feeling a little tired. <laughs> it's a lot of focus, right, to uh, to do this. And it's like every time I you know, work on a portrait, I feel like I've just taken the SATs or something. My brain feels a little fried. Um, uh, I'm going to just use this blending stump to kind of add a little bit more detail in some areas. Uh, this is a great opportunity to reinforce the structure of things, you know. It, and there, there comes a point in a drawing is if you, when your when your goal is to create a drawing that looks realistic, um, it, there there comes a point where it's something in it clicks in the brain where it's no longer these two dimensional marks on the surface, but now it's a three dimensional object, and we start to interpret those marks differently. Um, and I really like that, uh, that, that moment. And so, you know, where, you know, as I'm working on the eye, I'm think, seeing it as a three-dimensional form and wrapping those marks around the eye rather than these two-dimensional marks on the surface that we started with, you know, when we started with that gesture. Um, I'll do a little bit of drawing here with the eraser. And I'll keep things loose in the rest of the drawing, just kind of softening some of those edges that feel a little bit hard. Try to unify things. So some of these marks, they feel like they're floating on the surface a bit more, so knocking those down a little bit. But I think I will call it a day. I don't know about you all, but again, if there's something that you feel like I need to really address, um, feel free to shout it out. As I just said, we're done I'm making these corrections, so <laughs> I'm aware of the hypocrisy there. Um, but it is one of those things, that, and I think some of you have mentioned that before, there's like this if it's impulses, oh, just one more mark, one more thing to, to fix. Um, yeah. Phew. I, uh, Aida is saying the eye on the left needs a little more dark, question mark. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like in general, this, it's, again, when I see it in, in person here, this this view right here, uh, I feel much more confident in the value relationships. And then when I look up here, it, it, I I feel like I've lost that. Like I, um, and I I do feel like the um, the shadow shape around the eye needs to be increased here. So that's a, that's a good observation. Thank you for that. Um, I kind of lost that. And that feels like it's got a little bit more structure there. And I can let this side be a little bit lighter as it as it reacts to with more um, bounce light there. A lot of little tweaks that we can do, but I think as an exercise again, as 
you know, that's the, the, the role, you know, the purpose of the show is to, for us to practice. Um, and I feel like it's been an effective practice. Um, I might work on this a bit more, but if I do, if I do, I will share it in on the, the artist network page, the episode page. So that's pinned at the top of the chat here. And you also find it in the description. So if you've been drawing along and you want to share your work, I love to see the work that you've all done. So, um, go ahead and share it there. Uh, you know, all you have to do is sign into artist network. You don't have to be like a paid member or anything. Um, and it can be, it's a great place to show your work. Um, and I really appreciate the vulnerability that some of you have uh, demonstrated uh, sharing work. So you say, hey, I didn't do it. <laughs> I'm not happy with this, but here it is. Uh, and that's what, again, I've had shows like that here where we get through it and it feels like this battle. And uh, sure, I wish it had drawn better, but that's, you know, that's why we draw. Hopefully we do you know, hundreds of drawings. And if we can get a handful that we're really happy with, that's a good day. So um, hopefully you're not being too hard on yourself and expecting perfection with each drawing exercise. It's, this is the practice of it all. And we have to get through drawings that we're not happy with to get to the ones we are. Um, now, I think it's really important though, that with each drawing, be aware of what's going well. Uh, because the, the more you can define what's working, the 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 hard the the more hardwired it becomes in your brain. You're going to do that again the next time, hopefully. So if you can be aware of what you're doing well, what area you want to improve on, then you can move into the next trying with a greater degree of consciousness and address those issues. Keep the good things going. Improve the things that you want to improve on, and you always want to find something that you can improve on. That's what keeps you going, right? Um, and at least that's what keeps me going is that there's always something that that says, oh, I wish I could do it better. I think I can do it better, um, or I want to improve in this way, or I want to, I want to tackle this specific skill, or try one this approach to drawing. You know, that's there's always something that motivates that, and I think if you can bring kind of some awareness to it, um, you can and, and kind of an intentionality to it. That's when it really starts to to, um, to become part of your drawing process. It kind of hardwires into your drawing process. So, um, all right. Danielle is saying the right side of the face is a bit round. Oh my gosh, you're right. <laughs> I see that now. Thank you for that. Um, and so I just said we we're going to put that down, but now I got to fix it. Um, oh, it's so very subtle, but I think it does make a big difference. Uh, one of the things that, that I have kind of working to my advantage is that in the screen in front of me, I, I see the smaller thumbnail of the reference um, and and I have a larger a larger image too so I can sometimes using that smaller reference can help me to see some of those issues so I didn't see I don't see the difference in the shape when I look at the larger reference but as soon as you said it I looked at the small one you're right thank you um, so Whew. Let's see. I'm glad you guys learned so much today. Um, what is for next week? Oh, uh, we are doing some perspective drawings. So I found this cool cabin, of, uh, cool image of a cabin um, that we're going to draw with. So there's going to be some texture, primarily focusing on proportions. I don't know. I'm sorry, not proportions, but a perspective. I don't know what medium. Um, so I might do it in charcoal. Um, but, you know, we do that, we kind of switch mediums up every week, um, but it'll probably be a charcoal on white paper, focusing on perspective and also trying to get some, uh, some textural effects in there too. So um, I will hopefully get that drawing done today, get that built. So when you go to Artist Network, you can find the links to that leading up to it. So again, we meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, again, my name is Scott Meyer. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network. We're about a year into this. We started this when the pandemic struck and just kept it going. So we're on episode what, 91 or something like that. We've been really going strong. So I want to thank you all for making this happen. It has been great. Um, and I will see you all next week. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> Joan, I just saw your comment. I drew a cute little ghoul. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I can't wait to see your drawings. Share them on Artist Network. You'll find the link at the top. So um, subscribe and you'll get notifications when the next live event is happening.